to the Delaware Academy Special Board meeting. We'd like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Alright, our presentation tonight is the reopening of our school district in September and Kelly, Mrs. Kelly Zimmerman will begin, our superintendent, and thank you Mrs. Zimmerman. Okay, thank you. tuning in tonight. I want to begin, however, with a disclaimer that I have made, um, and we, our whole team, has made tremendous efforts to keep our community, at least weekly, appraised of our progress in what we're thinking in terms of reopening. Tonight is just another step in that process. What we're presenting tonight is where we stand currently with our thoughts regarding reopening, but I want to set that qualifier that this is not our final plan where we are landing. This is just another effort that now that we have some greater degree of detail, that we're able to turn around and share that out and kind of provide a stop point right now to entertain any questions that you as a board may have uh, regarding where we currently stand. So tonight I'm going to be talking to everyone about our collective commitment that we've talked about with our reopening plan committee, what the timeline is from the New York State Education Department, the requirements that are included in a reopening plan. We will talk about the results of our community survey, which had a tremendous turnout, and then where we currently stand in what continue to be just the proposed reopening plans. So as we brought together our entire reopening committee, which really represented a nice cross-section of stakeholders from throughout the district, one of the first questions that I asked, which may have been selfish, but I wanted to get a sense of knowing this community better and understanding more about the culture of DA, is what do we stand for here? And what are we going to ground this very deep and difficult work that we have to go through and navigate in the coming weeks as we make some tough decisions uh, regarding reopening? And so we started with the acronym Delaware Academy Central School District, DACSD, and together our reopening committee told me that if anything, we are dedicated. We commit to remaining academically focused, we are caring, we are student-centered, and we are determined. These are the tenets with which we are going to continue to ground our decision-making throughout this entire process. Here. All right, I need to pause because this is not the most updated uh, plan. Give me one second. I want to make sure that I'm giving everybody accurate information. Yeah, no, I, mean, I had it earlier this morning and it was the one on the flash drive. Can you open that flash drive for me again? Sure. We can just make sure that's the right one. Does this show the latest update? This is the one we shared earlier today, right? Yes. Nope, that's still not the right one. Can I pause for a minute and just grab it off because I have it right here on the laptop. Thank you. <laughs> That's what we do best, right? All right, am I set? All right, thank you everybody for your patience. I want to make sure that we are bringing the most updated information as I promised you. Okay, so knowing that we're grounded uh, in these tenets, I thought I wanted to take a minute just to reaffirm then what is our commitment to you? What is our commitment to our students? This I am going, I usually do not read slides word for word, but this one's so important, I feel it necessary to do that. Reopening our schools is a decision that we do take very seriously at DA. We understand, we understand that you as parents are placing great trust in us to ensure a safe environment 
for our students to return to and to live in. But in order to reopen safely, we are committed to prioritizing the health and safety of our students and staff. We will base decisions on the requirements, guidelines, and recommendations of the New York State Education Department, of the New York State Department of Health, and the Federal Center for Disease Control. As these are updated, we will also adjust our plans and our practices and protocols accordingly. As such, all members of our school community, this includes all of our administrators, teachers, staff, students, and visitors, will be held to the same standards and expectations that are governed by all the regulations of New York State and included in our final comprehensive reopening plan. All staff and students will be trained in these protocols and these will be regularly monitored and enforced. This is important for our parents to know up front because they are placing tremendous trust in making the decision to bring their students back to our district. So as we mentioned before the timeline, everybody's already aware of where we were at the early July. Throughout this month, we've continued to have ongoing evaluation of all the guidance documents as they've been rolling in and together brainstorming potential solutions. This Friday is when the uh, portal will be open in New York State to upload our template of our reopening plan. Now, that plan will also be made publicly available on our website, but you should also know that it will not uh, likely contain the degree of detail yet to answer the many outstanding questions that we have because the intent for Friday is to have that framework uploaded to the state. We are afforded the time to continue to drill down and work on all of those details and once we continue to arrive at those decisions we'll certainly be updating that plan so that our community can see that in live time. Uh, on August 7th we will hear from New York State on if we are permitted to open. It's worth noting that once these plans are submitted, they are considered approved by the State Education Department unless we hear otherwise. So there is not a waiting to see if the plan is approved, um, but there is a waiting to see on if we're permitted to proceed with one of these plans. It's important also that we recognize that this is not a linear process. Just to give everyone an appreciation of the kind of decisions that we're faced with as we're developing this, it's really inter interdependent on many required pieces of this plan. So not only are we called out to address all of these different quadrant areas, but simultaneously we have to build in provisions to make sure that this overall plan is flexible and responsive as our needs change and as our requirements change. To make sure we're considering staffing and how human resources can support the implementation of the plan. That we're assuring equity and access for everybody. Um, for all learners and access in terms of um, uh, technology platforms for all of our students. And then of course there are all the budget and fiscal um, pieces that are associated not only with this plan, but we're also not out of the woods with those state look back periods that we have to be aware of too as we're making decisions moving forward. And there's no one that comes before another. It's all kind of simultaneous um, thinking and design. What does remain consistent are some universal requirements. I've hit just a few here uh, regarding the clear on requirements for social distancing of six feet or the use of masks where social distancing is not possible. There is provisions for daily health screenings of all students, staff, and visitors to our district. We do have plans to begin to pilot some of this with our 12-month employees in the summer. There's clear use on PPE, requirements for daily hygiene and cleansing of our facilities. We have to develop plans that reflect both in-person and remote learning. Uh, we are asked in, by the state to make sure that we're thinking about our families and our family structure. If we're talking about developing cohorts of students to bring back to school, we have to ensure that continuity of learning. Within that, there's a clear focus on priority standards and maintaining the rigor associated with our curriculum and also the pacing of our curriculum. And we also need to make sure that we are addressing those diverse learning needs. So, now that we've absorbed all of those pieces, we also want to take a look at the results of our community survey. Today we had over 560 responses so far. Thank you, thank you to everybody who completed the survey, who encouraged others to complete the survey. The response was overwhelming um, and really, really great information. The majority of the respondents were our parents followed closely behind by our students. We had a lot of students coming in and completing the survey with us. 
Uh, we also had a nice group of community members who don't necessarily have students in our district currently who contributed to the outcome of the survey as well. And then, of course, we had contributions from our current employees. So this just gives an idea of the, the response sets within our survey. When we break that down and look at each of those questions that were asked within our survey, the first one looked at um, if we are to return to a model of instruction that includes some degree of face-to-face, -face, we wanted to get a temperature check just on comfort levels. What are people thinking right now? Where do we stand? You may see in parentheses this term actualized for some of these uh, responses. Outside of the percentages that fell in these quadrant areas, I also accounted for if we were to remove the respondents who don't have children at DA, then what, how would that change these percentages? So where you see the term actualized, it's just accounting for the people who did not, who do not have students currently at DA. So right now we're looking at 18% of respondents who are not at all comfortable with any degree of in-person learning. But on the, uh, on the inverse of that, 82% are either comfortable or somewhat comfortable depending on where our plan is. And so they are open and wanting to get back to some degree of in-person learning. In this area here, I picked up some of the open comments. So in those open comments section, I wanted to capture, and I did read every single one, and then I just wanted to capture the ones that either stood out or the ones that resonated with recurring themes uh, throughout the responses. And so some of the feedback, including, you know, please consider live online instruction where we're able to do that. There's definitely a call for small class sizes. Make sure that we're, you know, looking at those social distancing. There was some nice uh, feedback in terms of actual suggestions for solutions. Um, Hands-on workbooks, maybe having a section at each grade level be completely remote to meet some diverse needs. Um, definitely a call for face-to-face -face instruction. One of our seniors, or incoming seniors, said, I think we should all come back and wear a mask. Then when we asked the question, okay, so given these three models, which New York State has asked us to develop, so in our plan we need to have a model for fully um, in-person instruction if we were to bring everybody back 100%. A model that looks at some degree of hybrid, and then a model that also looks at complete remote instruction. So given these, where do, where do we fall in our community? We have a resonating 21% who are again saying, I prefer a full remote learning model. 80% saying, depending on where we land, we'd like to see some degree of in-person. And then again, just some additional feedback <coughs> on our community. There's definitely for as much training as possible uh, for our staff members. There's a, a call for some increased regularity and standardization and predictability at, at uh, instructional <coughs> at each grade level. <coughs> so then given all of that, we ask the question a little bit differently. If school does resume, what are you currently thinking right now? What are your current plans? So although we had 20% of respondents coming in saying that I want to be completely remote, when asked this question, that drops down to about 14% of the actualized respondents saying, right now I think I'm going to homeschool. I'll tell you that outside of that, I've had additional parents saying, I'm considering homeschooling, but it's really going to depend on where we fall. So it's important that you know that. Um, I also took a look at, so how does that compare with that question of homeschooling compared to where we stood last year? Thank you, Sue, for gathering that data for me. Um, in 1920, we had 33 students. We currently have 34 requests. So we had a few graduate last year who were students who were homeschooled, um, and a few more who have transferred in who are looking to do the same. But we've had many more inquiries and calls into the office than we have in the past regarding that. And when I use the term homeschooling, that is different than completely remote instruction. That's, you know, homeschooling is based on New York State laws surrounding homeschooling where parents are on their own to provide that instruction. We asked the question about transportation. Uh, just a keynote that we, while we cannot require parents to self-transport, we can ask the question. You know, if you had a choice this fall, what are you thinking right now uh, in terms of transportation? We had about 42% of respondents indicating that right now they would self-transport if we were back in school. Um, 
This is a little bit higher than our typical numbers of students who self-transport, but it's important to know in our decision making as we think about how we're going to load our buses and arrange for transportation in the fall. We talked about access. Uh, right now, we have between 88 and 89 percent of respondents saying, I do have pretty reliable internet um, for remote learning, regardless of the number of students in my household or other barriers that other families might be facing. Um, and at the same time, we have a number of respondents who are saying, I really don't. We can't ignore that. We have an obligation to address those equity gaps in terms of access. So that was important to know as well. If you uh, did complete the survey and found yourself in the blue, but you're really thinking, no, I do have other difficulties, um, we will be reaching out again. This is not the only time that you'll have opportunity to give us that feedback, because it's gonna be important that we identify those families with those types of needs. So we also took a minute to talk about, okay, so what lessons did we learn from last spring? And what worked best? And what were some challenges? Now, I wanna point out here that Thank you for all the feedback. This will inform our platform moving forward as we start to develop that remote learning platform in particular. However, it does not mean that we are able to accommodate every single one of these pieces that worked best. It doesn't mean we're going to be able to fix all of the challenges. But thank you for bringing those to our attention because that will help to inform that development of that platform moving forward. So the work of our reopening committee um, has really spent time digging into those guidance documents. We have a really long 100-page working template right now um, that we've just been dumping ideas into. That's a fluid document that's ongoing. That's not the same as our final reopening plan. It's just the tool by which we've been using to capture all different kinds of ideas, and it is chock full of them. Um, and we have remained solution-focused through the whole development. So back to those instructional model considerations. Again, I say these are considerations. I'm going to throw out this disclaimer that if you're at home watching, I, I understand the need to plan for fall and to start planning yesterday for that. Please don't start your plans based on what we're sharing tonight because it could change yet again. But we will do our best to keep everybody informed once we land on and we know where we're going because we know you need to make some important family decisions. So again, New York State wants us to develop a plan that looks at what does this look like if we had 100% daily in-person attendance of students and staff. So to that end, we've evaluated with our folks from buildings and grounds and our building uh, leaders, what is our capacity right now if we were to bring people, every student back? Do we have the ability to socially distance in all of our classrooms? The answer is no, we do not. We evaluated the use of some of our spaces that are, that are open within our buildings. And then we found we had shortages in staffing to be able to adequately support and staff that. Um, also, just because if the state says we can, does not necessarily mean that we should. We have to keep to the health and safety of our students and staff in the forefront of our decision making. So I would not recommend a model right now at 100% normal operation. Uh, we also have to develop a plan for a hybrid model, which means everybody has to attend daily but students either attend in person or remote. What that allows us to do is drop to about 50% capacity in the building at any one time. And we are gonna be sharing models tonight that kind of provide an overview graphic of what that might look like by dividing students up into what we're calling cohorts. As we talk about cohorts of students or who to bring in on what days, we have committed to prioritizing that by families so that the entire uh, family unit will be either here together or in remote learning together. We're talking about a lot of different nitty gritty pieces. What is daily instruction then gonna look like? We're talking about both synchronous and asynchronous models, meaning that instruction, if I'm in a synchronous model, my teacher is teaching live to 12 students in class and maybe also live streaming that instruction for students at home to watch live at the same time. That's a synchronous model. Whereas an asynchronous model, maybe math teacher is giving a lesson and it's being recorded for students to watch at home at a different time. So it's not happening simultaneously. So those are both types of things that we're talking about. 
And then that third model is completely, um, completely remote and online. Keep in mind that we will be required to pivot and shift to a completely remote learning platform if either infection rates increase or the county or state requires us to do so. So now we're going to get a little bit more into our school hybrid models. I'm going to ask um, Julie to come up and to present to us the elementary school hybrid model. Um, again, this is just a framework at this point. Don't start making plans based on this yet, but this is an opportunity to look at really kind of uh, digging in a little bit to what we're thinking. Yeah. So, Mrs. Mabel. So, we have looked at um, splitting the elementary school group into co two cohorts. Um, the first cohort would be in person Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and would be remote on Thursday and Friday. Cohort two would be remote on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and in person on Thursday and Friday. The following week, your cohort one will be in person on Monday and Tuesday only, and then cohort two will be in person on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So Wednesday will switch every other week with the cohort. Um, and we've, we've looked at the calendar and, and made sure that if you're in cohort one, you're pretty much going to be here on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and cohort two would be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, the the in-person and the remote classes will be taking place and doing the exact same things. So the in-person um, the in-person teaching for CKLA or for Eureka Math will be the same whether you're here or remote. Your teachers will be doing the same thing. They'll be teaching the same lessons on the same day so that students don't lose any time in learning. Um, even though they'll only be here five out of ten days in a two-week period in person, they'll have ten days of instruction happening. Is that okay? All right. Um, family, the, we are trying to do family-based cohorts K-12. So um, the kids will, will come in in a, in a family group. Um, students with special needs, we're looking at attending daily. Um, I would like to have one teacher per grade level that is going to serve as my remote learning specialist. And that person will provide all that remote learning for the grade level. So they'll work in conjunction with the other two teachers at their grade level to make sure that the um, classes that are going on each day are the same. Um, synchronous or live stream instruction for health, art, music, and library. And that is so that the librarian comes into Mrs. Bowker's class <coughs> and does a library lesson of the day and the kids at home are seeing that exact same lesson. So they don't miss out on having library with Mrs. Oliver. They get to be in, they'll just be in from live streamed. That keeps our students that are in the actual class from moving about the building, which we're supposed to keep to a minimum. Um, pushing group lessons will happen by the counselor when the students are here in person. So if Mrs. Bowker has a group of students that's in person, um, in week one and a group of person that's in or group of students that's in person the end of week one um, the counselor will do training both of those times so that'll that'll be something new to schedule in but we'll we'll get there um, daily PE will happen either remotely or in person and daily PE is only for kindergartners first graders are um, four times a week and then second through fifth is um, three times a week so that, that will go. We've even talked about um, and have had many ideas, and one of the ideas that came up is maybe having GoPro cameras that will help the kids see what's going on. That doesn't mean that it's going to happen, but, but we've talked about it. Um, I think that's it. I think. Good. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank well, you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Robbins has been involved in all of the planning and decision making. Um, I know that she's home tonight watching us and she was here and actually presented this slide for our uh, work group that met earlier today. 
We tried out if she was presenting remotely, but the, the audio feeds wouldn't pick it up. So I told her that I would take this slide um, in her absence. So at the middle and high school model, we're looking at a similar model where students are attending in person five days out of the 10, out of the 10 day total. Things are gonna look a little bit different though, and our counselors have been hard at work every single day they've been in here trying to make this schedule kind of happen and load in real life. Um, we are prioritizing the core content areas at every grade level, but we're also looking at the individual graduation pathways of every student in our middle and high school, particularly in our high school, prioritizing those classes that students are going to need to graduate and work toward the pathways or the outcomes that they want. I've asked uh, our middle and high school uh, counselors to start to develop a schedule where we're not eliminating anything at this point and let us know what are the numbers look like. So we are truly in a challenging and unique situation because we've never been asked to develop a high school schedule that can be magic and make it all happen. Um, I'm also not going to promise you that it will look like it does in a typical year. It just won't be able to. Um, I am not saying that that means that we're at a point where we're needing to talk about what courses take priority or that we're eliminating any particular courses yet. We are not. But I will be transparent and honest if those are the types of decisions that we may be looking at as we move into developing this schedule at the high school throughout the year. Uh, we recognize that, again, we want our students with special needs to get as much in person as possible. We're trying to develop a schedule where they can attend daily. And also our students who attend CTOE courses at BOCES. Uh, right now, BOCES has not developed their final structure yet. They're kind of waiting to see where different districts are landing. Uh, but the last that we heard is that they may have the ability to be at 100% capacity. And so that would, um, that would put us in the position to prioritize our students who attend those programs and also our CTEP programs uh, on a daily basis in order to get the other required courses in that they're going to need. We also talked about you know, identifying teachers or people at each grade levels or content areas to specialize in that remote learning platform. We had talked about a concept of having Wednesdays be more flex days, but to just as recently as today, as our counselors were doing the work of putting together the schedule, they came to me and said, Kelly, we really need that Wednesday to, to pull this off. And I said, absolutely, um, whatever that's going to take. We talked about whether those synchronous and asynchronous models are going to work better. We want to provide flexibility for our families, but at the same time, we need to ensure that all of our students and teachers are being held accountable to not only deliver consistent instruction across, regardless of what teacher or child may have, but that students are, are prioritizing being in school, um, either remotely or in person. In order to accommodate this kind of schedule, we also toyed a bit with some block scheduling ideas. Again, to eliminate some movement between classrooms, um, either by subject area or students are in one classroom for two periods and the teacher just changes. So we're still toying with all of those models. But as you can probably well imagine, um, at this grade level, given all of the requirements and as they change up through high school, we still have many unanswered questions. We have started to stage our instructional spaces. So just to give you kind of a, an idea where we normally would have classrooms that can hold between 25 and 35 students, this is kind of what a socially distanced classroom will look like. We're currently staging all of our classrooms socially distanced to give us an idea of our capacity in all of those classrooms. Same thing for transportation. Um, we do have guidance that says that we can load with greater numbers than we originally thought we might be able to with the use of masks. Again, because we can doesn't mean we should. So I'm working closely with Mr. Verspor to figure out what is really the, the best way and the recommended way to load all of our buses. Um, that's going to be based on where our cohorts fall. It's going to be based on how many students continue to access our district transportation. Um, but regardless, masks are unequivocally required um, on buses. Um, I am going to um, ask Jeff to come on up, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about what this means for athletics.
Mr. Ferrara. Thank you. Uh, the New York State uh, Public High School Athletic Association formed a task force formed a task force to look at how they could reopen um, the districts and have sports in a safe manner. Um, with the implementation of the task force, they handed out some recommendations recently. Um, the first being that they have pushed the start date of fall sports from August 24th to September, September 21st. Reason being is they wanted to put the horse before the carriage, meaning we needed to get back in the school building on September 8th, figure out how the educational process was going to work before we started to figure out how the athletic process was going to work and we were going to travel between communities and play sports. Um, their focus is on student health and safety and on participation. The focus this year is not on winning championships um, and, and really their focus is on competing regionally. The reason for that is regions tend to have similar rates of virus within them and to travel outside of your region to areas with higher rates of virus or, or otherwise. Um, so the focus is regionally, safely, um, with as much participation as we can provide them. Um, looking back to March of last year, the participation rate was zero for the entire spring. And, and they really want to improve on that, but they want to find a way to do it safely moving forward. Um, so in the fall, if we start September 21st, um, and we know that snow flies in upstate New York shortly after that, um, our goal is to schedule regionally, get as many games in as we can before the snow flies, give our students an opportunity to participate if we can do so safely, um, but there will be no state championships or regional championships of any kind. Those have been canceled for the fall of 2020. Um, if we can start sports on September 21st, the goal is to roll through the abbreviated um, fall season and then continue on with athletics as they've been scheduled, a regular winter and a regular spring. If we can't start sports on September 21st, they would like to go to this tentative abbreviated model of sports starting in January 4th. Uh, we would have the first season, which would be winter sports, basketball, indoor track and field, and wrestling. They would run for 10 weeks. Then we would transition to season two, uh, which would be sports such as football, cross country, soccer, and volleyball. Another 10 weeks and finishing with a 10 week season, uh, season three, which would be our traditional spring sports like track and field, baseball, softball, golf, tennis. Um, some of these sports, depending on what category they get listed in, high risk, like football and wrestling, moderate risk, low risk, could mean their sports season gets switched from um, season one to season three, or season two to season three. Uh, these dates are tentative for the time being. These groupings of sports are tentative for the time being. It's just a model that New York State can give to say, we're very interested in getting all three seasons in and getting every kid an opportunity to participate in the sports they want, if we can do so safely. I think that's it. Thank you, Mr. Ferrara. Thank you. So we've just talked a little bit about a potential hybrid learning model. Then we have our complete, the third uh, piece that we have to submit to the state, our plans for a complete uh, remote learning model. This just means everybody, just like we were in the spring, everybody's remote at all grade levels. We need to truly focus on team planning to provide continuity of learning. I know we use this term a lot throughout the state in the spring, and it means even more moving into the fall. We have the opportunity now to be reflective and to learn from uh, what we went through that spring. So truly the focus is on providing that same level of instruction expectations across grade levels and delivery of instruction. We have the opportunity to identify and teach the priority standards. There will need to be alignment of the tools that are used across grade levels to deliver instruction, the uh, necessary professional development associated with those, 
um, and all of the, the platforms for both of our teachers and our students. It'll be important to look at daily schedules and to establish regular routines and regular schedules. Again, so there's more alignment K through 12 in the delivery of instruction. We will need to be clear on our expectations for students, parents, teachers, and staff. We've talked about developing mutual commitments and expectations, both what our families can expect from our district, but also what our district uh, types of commitments we're asking for from our families to support learning in this model. Regardless of what model we land in, we're still required to track daily attendance. That may look different depending on what model, but we still have to report to the state daily attendance and be accountable um, for students who have difficulty with chronic attendance um, concerns. And then a focus on engage, uh, designing engaging lessons. So all of this being said, we also need to be focusing on how are we going to prepare our teachers and our staff moving forward. We need to, we've talked a lot about what can professional development look like for our teachers and staff, just to answer some basic questions. What are my new expectations as I move forward? These are questions we didn't have time to ask in the spring when we shifted to this model, but we need to do our due diligence in making sure that our teachers are prepared. We've already started that work uh, through summer offerings. We've had a huge number of teachers participating um, in a blended learning online course that was provided through BOCES, and we've already been receiving some really positive feedback um, from teachers on that. We're talking about how to use our fall staff development days and what pieces we're going to need to have in there to have our teachers ready to hit the ground running. And then also, it can't be a one and done. We have to be planful for how we're going to continue to support and address ongoing needs as they morph throughout the, throughout the school year. Same thing for students and parents. We have to be looking at the types of questions, and a lot of these questions are going to be the same for parents as they are for our teachers. We need to make sure that we are setting aside intentional time for our students and our teachers to practice these new routines and structures before we even jump into formal instruction at the beginning of the year, which is going to require a lot of modeling. There's needs, there will need to be a huge focus on the mental health of teachers and our students and staff and also what those social emotional needs look like as we transition really into kind of a new temporary normal. There's not really a great word to describe it, um, but we need to prioritize frequent communication with families. And this is everywhere. This is not just my weekly updates. This is from our building administrators. This is from teachers to parents. This is across the entire organization. And I do plan on holding student parent information meetings when we have additional details and information to offer. So again, to, to kind of summarize, the reopening plan that we have to submit on Friday will be just that framework. And the scope and the detail of that, though, will be continuously added to and updated. And I'll provide you with the updates as that uh, gets, gets nailed down more. It will include um, the considerations for each of the three models, as NYSEG requires. And then that will also be posted to our website for everybody to take a look at. So, I wanted to take a minute and just pose this question to our board. This is a question that we've been talking about as superintendents regionally. This is a question that our, our principals and district administrators have been grappling with. And this is a question that I've been asked by many, many parents. Uh, it's been suggested in the survey and been asked to me individually. Do I have the ability to choose a platform for my child? Specifically, can I choose between a completely remote learning platform where 20% of our respondents were saying, I'm only comfortable if, um, versus whatever model we land in to bring kids back, which right now will most likely be that hybrid model. So as the team brainstormed some advantages and challenges associated with that, I just wanted to throw this out there for consideration. I will let you know that many districts in our region are moving toward offering our, their families a choice. Again, it was echoed in our community survey results and feedback. It also addresses some of those homeschooling questions for those families that might be on the fence. It certainly addresses those capacity concerns. Um, Mr. Um, Schultz is gonna go over some of the financial implications <coughs> associated with the state aid uh, pieces. Anybody who chooses to be completely remote or coming to see us in person uh, will all be counted as enrolled students. It must be fully enrolled in the district. 
It addresses some transportation concerns, and but, but most importantly, it also gives us a platform to maintain continuity if a student needs to find themselves in quarantine for two weeks, so that they're not counted as absent from school, so they can continue to jump into that remote platform and continue with their learning. If we did move to this uh, and provided this choice for our families, we already need to have plans to be completely fully remote. What it does for us is it ensures that all of our students who are engaged in one platform or another have access to certified teachers in their content area. But we would, uh, we would ask that families do choose one or the other. What I would caution us against is being completely loose with this and letting parents um, and children flop in and out. So, you know, my child, my teenager, and I, I can say this as a mom, doesn't want to get out of bed this morning. So they'll just pick up the, the recorded lesson later, even though they're registered as an in-person student. Um, we just don't have the capacity to be unpredictable in terms of what students we're expecting in our classrooms every day and what students we are planning on serving remotely. Um, and it would be just a, a nightmare to try to track the attendance. So if we, I would propose that if we are going to look at allowing our family's choice, that we be pretty explicit with that expectation. Mr. Schultz. So Mr. Schultz is going to come up and talk to us a little bit about some of the financial considerations uh, for reopening. Uh, one of the big questions I received um, about three weeks ago was from a parent actually calling and concerned about if they chose to go online, what kind of effect would that have on state aid? As you know, state aid is usually figured out by multiple formulas, one of them being attendance, one of them being enrollment. Um, so did some research, and I was right on some things, wrong on other. But the wrong thing, actually, the, the, the right thing is that we have... Um, 65%, I'd say almost 70% of our aid is foundation aid. Foundation aid is made up of almost $7 million, and that is based upon attendance and enrollment from 2008-2009. I know there's been talk, multiple budget meetings, multiple years, the state may change the formula, they may go back to a different, um, uh, different formula for foundation aid. That has not happened, and we're not alone. Every district in New York State is in the same kind of boat. So they're going back on attendance uh, records from or attendance numbers from many, many years ago. The state has talked about changing that uh, multiple years, but they have not. And most districts and all districts have said, if you're going to change it, make sure you hold harmless of all the districts right now. Because to do that would really take a lot of money away from most districts, if not all districts, due to declining enrollment <clears throat> in just about probably 80% of the school districts in New York State. So. The large chunk of enrollment or uh, an aid based on enrollment will not change at all, even if it's an online formula, because they're still enrolled at the district, they're still attending the district, even on a full online platform. If parents choose to go to a full homeschool method, which is basically we are kind of hands off at that point, they're really not ours. They are part of the district, but they're not ours as far as enrolled or attendant. Then you could have a little bit of effect, about 6%. We have what are known as categorical aids. Library materials each year is allocated per student. Uh, train our uh, technology. We also have um, uh, library and then textbooks. So it's not, that makes up about $60,000 of the total aid package that we receive, which is close to $8.9 million. So it wouldn't affect anything to do with building aid. I don't see it affecting transportation aid. We're already running those routes if a student decides not to go. <clears throat> On the online, that was a big question. If students go online, how does it affect our aid? It does not. So just want to make that clear really quickly off the bat. Um, these assumptions are also based upon current regulations, current laws uh, governing state aid, and state aid. The governor could come out tomorrow and say, we're going to change the formula and we're going to go to something different. I don't see that happening. I don't see them be, believe me, Talking about those look back um, <clears throat> aid reductions, they're still kind of lingering. We forecasted about 20% of three separate aid payments. Uh, we will see if that actually comes true. I know that there's a stimulus package on the table, <clears throat> uh, and we'll hopefully see 
the first payment out of the three not be affected whatsoever, and then possibly two in the, in the following year. But we have budgeted and tried to offset if that does happen. Uh, so as far as whatever model we choose, it's not going to affect our state aid. It's not going to affect the bottom line. We can still uh, work with our budget we currently approved back in June. Um, back period. Additional expenses that we've we've seen right now, <coughs> PPE is a, a, a pretty big one. We're about twenty-four thousand dollars in expenses regarding uh, PPE. Masks are pretty easy to get right now. Sanitizers somewhat easy. Clorox wipes are difficult to get. N95 masks are pretty much impossible to get without a two to three month turnaround. Um, but we've ordered, I think, up to about twelve thousand masks. Uh, it's based upon a formula to look at. Uh, those are both cloth and disposable. The rule is um, students can supply their own masks. District can give them masks to a student if they, are, they come into school and they don't have one. The rule is also that we will supply it for staff. So um, we are currently about, like I said, 12,000 masks, uh, isolation gowns, booties, face shields. We've purchased quite a few of those. We have 12 thermal uh, temperature scanners that we've ordered. Six are here, six are on their way. The other big piece right now that we're trying to get our hands on is polycarbonate glass. Um, at first they said, okay, you can use plexiglass as far as for barriers. SCD came back and said, no, it's a fire hazard. So we have to buy a different type of product. We luckily didn't jump in and buy 30 panels of it. Uh, we were going to, uh, but <laughs> luckily we did not. <clears throat> we have located some of this glass. It's just hard. It's just taking a while to get. Uh, besides that, uh, signage, we have purchased signage for, uh, for the entire building, including buses. So um, The big piece besides the PP, I see PP probably going up to maybe about $30,000. Uh, the big piece now is going to be um, professional development. And we were very adamant about not just training instructional staff, but having our support service staff on the same page. So I think it's important to have bus drivers know what the teachers are doing, teachers know what transportation is doing, and so we work as one unit. So that's going to take some additional staff development uh, funding. A lot of your 10 months, of course, are not working throughout the summer, but we'll allocate funding for that to bring them in prior to school starting so everyone knows how this is going to operate. It's going to be completely different than what we're all used to. Other than that, we should be okay. Uh, we can't buy any more buses. We can only get, what, how many right now on a bus? Maybe we're talking 11. 11. So we're looking at maybe higher numbers if possible, if they'll allow it. Um, but, you know, unfortunately in transportation, first of all, buses are not cheap. They're about 125 a piece probably, and they just don't make them that quick. So um, we'll look at the transportation will be a big pull where we hope we uh, these are additional expenses that were not in the current budget, correct? Right. Because they were right. not budget for original. Right. Yeah, when we set the budget back in May, you know, we didn't, <clears throat> there wasn't much, I mean, of course, we do, we have supplies and materials throughout the 1620 codes for the nurses and things like that, but the numbers that they ended up pushing were much higher when SCD came up with the regulations. Mm -hmm. The professional development was, of course, listed in the guidelines, but it's something that we're taking a lot more serious to make sure that everyone's on the same page. We can, uh, we can work around that if needed to make sure that everyone's trained properly in, uh, in a timely manner. Thank you. <coughs> so the reality is during budget development time last spring, we simply were not in receipt of all the requirements yet. So the district could not have forecasted you know, the ability to budget for everything that, that we're going to be faced with. And there may be still things that we just don't know yet because this is all fluid and can continue to change. So thank you, Mr. Schultz. So next steps, we're going to, again, continue to refine this plan and communicate that out, which will get deeper into the details of the framework. We're always committed to remaining solution focused and to maintain communication with our entire community. I didn't want to end, however, without bringing to everybody's attention some additional comments that really caught my eye throughout that survey. The comments overwhelmingly reinforced for us that our community does place their trust in us. The community does support us. 
They understand and are empathic to the really difficult decisions that we have to make because we are constantly being being reminded that we're not gonna be able to make everybody happy. You know, in, in many cases, some, some people see this as there's really not a win-win. Um, I choose to flip that and think that we will make the best decisions possible for our students, and that continues to drive us always. But we do know that we have parents and community partners ready and willing to partner and to support us in this process. Finally, probably one of the most touching comments that, that really, uh, gave me the feels a bit as I read it, was from one of our students who said, I cannot explain how much I want to be back in school. It's going to be my senior year. I want to be with my teachers and I want to be with my friends. So as we've even toyed with models of, you know, bringing many elementary kids back full time and high school kids remain online, this, <laughs> this one keeps me saying, no, we got to get everybody back here to some degree. Um, but I just wanted to share that with everybody as well. So thank you for bearing with us. Thank you to our uh, administrators and supervisors who helped uh, co-present tonight. Um, and at this point, we're open to any questions that the board might have, knowing full well that the answer may still be, I don't know. Uh, I have one question to Mr. Ver Versport. Um, in the illustration there was like one dot for row one, one student. But if that family had three children, could they not all be in that same first row? Yes, they're saying that they're family units, they can be sure of seat. So, Depending on the size, two, whether it's two or three, but yes, they could, as long as not crouching on the next seat and the next student that's social distancing at six feet. So in truth, there could be more than 11 on the bus if they're, oh, because of family right. units. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, the other one, uh, I was when you mentioned that um, masks are to be worn uh, for social uh, in the school, but once a, a student is socially distant in the classroom, will the student be able to take off their mask? And if they can, what will happen if they have to speak? So, uh, just to reiterate the question is really what, what's going to be the policy on masks, right? What are the details surrounding masks? Uh, we have right now based decisions on all of the guidance and all of the meetings that we've had with departments of health from all of our surrounding counties. I was in a meeting as recently as Thursday that also included medical professionals um, from Bassett Healthcare. And they have indicated that the guidance within the state ed document is spot on that the minimal compliance is that students must always wear masks when entering our school buildings, when passing at halls, until they can sit and remain socially distanced at six feet. At that point, they can remove their masks. That social distance has been scientifically recommended to prevent the transmission at that distance. So uh, you can never guarantee anything 100%. But even when a student is speaking or addressing the teacher, there's very low risk of transmission. We have not landed on a final decision yet to say that that will be our practice. That is how we've been conducting ourselves with adults, as you can see from our meeting here tonight, uh, through the summer. But the committee has not landed on a final decision uh, as to whether or not to require masks 100% of the time. For districts that are requiring masks 100% of the time, including in the classroom, they still have to provide what are called mask breaks. So there still must be time when we allow students and adults to remove their mask to take a break from that. So we haven't landed there yet, but all of the medical guidance that we've been provided thus far has indicated that it's safe to do so. And my final question would be, who is on your opening committee? You it was a... It is. Um, anyone in this room, I think almost everybody in this room is on the committee. All of our supervisors, um, we have a number of teachers, all of our administrators. Uh, Mr. Letty is our Board of Education member. Uh, we have both of our union representatives um, from both um, the teachers union and also from our support staff union who are on that. Who am I missing, guys? Pardon? Guys. All of our counselors are on the committee. 
Um, and many of those people on the committee are also parents in our district. Mr. Letty uh, actually brought up uh, for consideration that moving forward, we might want to consider including a parent who's not an employee of the district to be brought into that committee. So like everything else, this is fluid, and I'm certainly open to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, if we do allow uh, for parents to have complete online learning, mm -hmm. would that give us more capacity for students to have full day, full week of class learning? If we had less students interested in coming back full time, would we allow us to have the space and the room and the time for students to come back full time if they choose? Great question. I'm just going to repeat it to make sure everybody could hear yeah, what you were asking back there. I mean, so yeah. the question is, if we allow for a remote learning uh, platform and we have a certain percentage of our student population who choose that, will that then, will we rethink our capacity limits? If we're only looking at serving an 80% capacity, can we move from 50% to 80% theoretically if 20% are at home? Did I capture that yes. right? Okay. So we did start to look at this. <laughs> so um, my alarm is going off on my phone, which is just my Monday night reminder that I need to put the garbage out when I get home. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I apologize for that interruption. Um, so we did start to look at that a little bit. In fact, today uh, Mrs. Mabel was just looking at, at that at a couple grade levels. It still presents some challenges for us. You know, obviously we want to bring as many kids back um, as possible, but only if it's safe to do so. And we even tried to brainstorm different solutions around that, but even at that level of capacity, it was challenging. Um, it also begs the question of how soon do we ask parents for that commitment, but we can't ask them for the commitment if we don't have the model yet. Right? So, you know, it kind of becomes a little bit of a, a sequential <laughs> nightmare as far as that goes. But we have thought of that, and that is something that we've evaluated. Uh, but even if all 20% stuck with a remote learning model, we, it would still be very tentative, um, and it would be tight. What if, Kelly, in thinking about what we offered, what if we prioritize not necessarily everything we offer? In other words, could you think about uh, developing what would be a core set of uh, you know, subjects and then say that you know maybe it's a priority for in-person core versus um, distance hybrid with everything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we were to do, if we had that priority, then maybe it's different by grade level. In other words, you know, you may think about it differently from elementary or middle school to high school. Does that free up resources to allow in-person for that number she's talking about, 600-ish, if we didn't try to offer every subject? You know what I mean? I so, do. Let me, let me repeat what I think you're saying. Is if we prioritize and looked at, and I'm immediately thinking high school, yes. it was you were describing that. If we looked at what are those courses that need to be the highest enrolled or that are required for a region's diploma, and if we prioritize those as in person and sought to provide the electives in a remote model or more of a distance learning model, what would that do for our numbers and our ability to bring students back in person? Is that right? Um, Generally? Part of it, yeah. Okay. I think what I meant is, could you mentioned that having everybody in the space was a staffing, presented a staffing mm -hmm. issue. What if, and that's with trying to offer, you know, for the most part, everything that we offer. What if we didn't offer things that were non core, right? And so then you freed up staffing resources to then work within the core model within the space for potentially a lower number that would come if we give the choice. See what I'm saying? So let's say we offer French. Maybe this year we don't. And the French teacher becomes a co-teacher with an English teacher. You know, um, something that would, again, free people up and, and perhaps the, the core subjects, that teacher is the teacher 
record setting, you know, the curriculum, but you know, you use people in a different way. The only reason I'm saying this is I'm just thinking about college and career readiness. I think that the, we've always been very proud of what we offer across the platform, but knowing that if, when it really comes down to it, someone's transcript, the core is really the big thing. And just looking at you know some of the, the challenges, I think the first one you look, you list here is absolutely spot on. You know, my child learns better face to face, which probably was on there quite a bit. You know, was the top one. Um, coupled with the fact that for so many parents, having people at home part time, even if it's three days one day, two days the next week is going to be a, a huge challenge for people. And you know, that's not unique to Delta, that's across the whole state. You're so, referring to this slide? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I'm talking about, you know, sort of the first one, um, balancing my job with childcare and schoolwork. I mean, you know, who's gonna be there at the eighth grade mm -hmm. that's at home? Um, and then the, the last piece, which I think is, there's a lot of research now is, is the, Socialization and the, the mental health aspect of I'm just home by myself, and uh, so it, I just wondered if if we didn't try to do it all. I guess I'll go back and try to restate this. Right? If we didn't try to do it all. We said these are our priorities academically. We we sort of disperse and distribute our resources differently with teachers. We allow the option of doing either. Does it work? <coughs> You don't have to answer that. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's bringing about, I, I don't have an answer to that, um, but it's something that I would want to bring back to our counselors and kind of throw out there as additional consideration. While you're speaking, I'm thinking of our 11th and 12th graders who need elective to graduate to finish out their CTE sequences, to finish out their CTEP sequences. There, there will be a lot of those kind of sing, you know, those singlets out there um, that may need that. And the one thing I have asked our counselors to gather for us is to quantify what does that look like? What are the must-haves, mm -hmm. even outside of the right. court? Yes. Right. So we've got the, the core coursework. Mm -hmm. Then step, and next step, what are the must-haves that students need to graduate? And so starting to prioritize that way, and how much can we, do, can we really do? Right. But you made me think about could some of those other ones be offered as a distance learning type of approach or model if there are some of those electives? I also asked them to look at um, what did enrollment look like before this, right? How many, what were those electives that were, had the highest enrollment? Mm -hmm. And what are the implications for that? And so I need to know what the implications of our decision making are for every single high school yeah. student so that we can really prioritize and decide. Because Seth, you're spot on. The reality is we're going to shoot for the stars, but we will not be able to accomplish everything in this year. And the other piece is this is just temporary, folks, right? And this is to get us through this year and to try, try to do the best for our kids that we can, give it yeah, a release. And, and I know you, there's a full recognition of that. I, I think the recognition of the anomaly that it is, mm -hmm. and the recognition of the fact that we really have to prioritize those most important things. And Without that, a doubt. That to, to say we're going to do it all is <laughs> just, that's hard. That's we won't be able right to. Right. We won't be able to. And so, you know, what as a district, are, what are the things that we're saying are the top priority? And then can we start with that and, you know, build from there? You know, kind of as you're saying, we're looking at what are the most haves? What are the um, things that can wait and either maybe optionally do those online if someone wants to because it could be theoretically pre-recorded or something like that. Um, you know, it's just, it, I think it brings us back to the priorities. Absolutely. Can I ask Councilman? Yeah, no, go ahead. So uh, I'm going to tell you what I just heard in my brain because now, because I'm a teacher, <laughs> so I have that hat that I bring to this table too. <clears throat> So if I was a high school French teacher, I might have to teach a high school English class this year or a high school math class or a high school science class this year. I don't know how 
I mean, it's not just the guidance department she has to run that body. It's the teachers' union. There's a teachers' contract. Sure, sure. And I, I, I do all I can to teach fourth grade. <laughs> so, I mean, so, yeah, I could imagine if I wasn't, you know, in that realm that um, now I'm going to have to go teach them. I don't know. Yeah. People are specialized in the high school. Sure. You know, that's what the degrees are. They're specialized. And I, elementary is different than that. Just, I think what I was thinking of would be more of a co-teaching where you're saying to someone for a year, um, we don't know that we can have and schedule a smaller elective class, but we know that we have, you know, a master's level person and a teacher that with the right resources and supports could for a period of time support learning. I mean, I know that that's not perfect, of course, because everybody wants to do what they're used to doing, but I think we're outside that box. And you know that may be further yet, but this is kind of feels to me like an everything's on the table no, time. Everything's on the table. You know, and not to say this ever is permanent, but equally as challenging for some is to be online, as evidenced by what we went through this spring. And I'm not saying it wasn't with everybody's best effort, but there were clearly people that really had that ability, and then there was a lot of challenge too. So I think there's pros and cons to a lot of it, but I'm trying to look at what on the list is seemingly the most important thing, and that's just the end result is the experience. So I know there's all the other agreements in the unions. I'm just hoping everybody comes with a little bit of flexibility to give these guys, because I, again, I just don't think we're going to get it all well, we're thank you for that. <laughs> we're not only outside the box, we're miles away from the box. <laughs> um, right? And, but there are things that push us back into the box. Contractual obligations, um, you know, teach certifications, the, the reality that teachers can only be asked to teach one, con one, one period outside of their content or um, one content area outside of their certification. So that's another reason why we do have union representation, certainly on that district-wide reopening committee. And you know, I will say that I've been more than impressed with the flexibility and thinking of not just our union representatives, but all of our teachers who have said and reached out and said, whatever you need me to do, you know. But you're, you bring up a good point too, yet. You know, that's all, those are all those pieces of that interdependent model, right? Can you, if this is mostly for the parents that are watching at home, just to give them the most information that, that we can, could you kind of maybe run through a scenario of we're in person, whether it's hybrid or everybody, what it's gonna look like? Like for example, when their kid gets on the school bus, they're gonna to have to sanitize their hands. Then they sit down and wear masks. And when they get off the school bus, they have to say, I don't know. But when they walk into the school, um, are they gonna be met by somebody you know, with a temperature check? Like, can you maybe run through what you think might be? Maybe you can't yet, but do you know what it might be for my child who's going to come to school? And I'm not allowed to go in there with them. What, mm -hmm. it, what am I, what can I prep him for? And what, what, what do I know is going to be happening to him? Are they taking his temperature? Are they, you know, making him wash his hands before he goes here or there? Like, like you know, can you try to address that a little bit? I can try, but I won't even come close. Okay. Um, but I need to preface that by saying that my heart goes out to every parent who's not only faced with that, that unknown, but also unknowns about providing for care on the other days for my child. I mean, there are so many pieces that as a mom, my heart bleeds for. Um, there are requirements that will, that will involve daily screenings. We haven't gotten to the degree of, de of detail yet. There will be required health screenings for all employees and for all of our students. Do you think, do you think when they enter the school? I, or, or they're gonna go into the school and they're gonna go in the classroom and it'll happen there? So New York State does allow for that to happen at home prior to arrival, but we need to be able to chart that. Um, we have to, and that does include parents taking their temperature of their children at home potentially. Doesn't mean that's where we are, have decided or landed yet but the state does allow for that. So there are, will be required mechanisms for daily health screenings, including temperature checks. What we cannot do is keep a record of medical information here. So 
you know, if there's an online mechanism for someone to, to uh, just toss that information into so that we can capture that, they can say, my child does not have a fever above 100, but they're not required to list what that is. So, you know, there, there are some, some protocols surrounding that. Uh, but if a parent, I can tell you that we will have plans that if a parent does not have a thermometer at home or an ability to report that, then we're still obligated to make sure we're screening that child upon arrival. Um, once we have all the questions, those answers, which are really great questions, then we'll, we'll certainly get that out because I understand that that could be a, a deal breaker for a decision for a parent. A deal breaker, but so for, for the kids that do go to school, the parents that need to have those conversations with their child, school's going to look different this year. When you get on the bus, they're going to have you do this or you're going to have to do this or when you walk into the school, you know, they're going to take your temperature. Like if, if when you know, if, you know, if, mm -hmm. if, if some time, like a, like a, like a, whatever, like the protocol, the specific protocol of what's going to happen and can get set home or something so parents can have a, you know, you like to prep their kids and have a conversation with their kids before they go. So now I know that. we're not going to, I'm assuming parents are not going to, even at kindergartners, parents are not going to be allowed to go into the classroom, into the school and take their kindergarten to the classroom. So, I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of conversations and prep that has to go into from the parents to the child, but they need the information. Absolutely. Okay. Not only is that good to do, it will be required. Okay. It is required that we do that, that we give the parents the information, including all the protocols that we need to land on so that they can be prepared. No, thank you. One more. Uh, yeah, one more because I know we have other things on, on the agenda that we need to get to. So. block scheduling. You had yes. block scheduling. Uh, with the way the middle school is set up, it seems that block scheduling might work for them if you know they have four groups, four teachers. They learn science all day. Tuesday, they learn English all day. You know, that, I just wanted to throw that out there as another idea for actually having in-person school education for people who would want that or that we would want. Uh, that would keep uh, quarantine groups almost together. So uh, group A is always together, and they're going to learn their subject matter in blocks. And I just wanted to throw that out there as another option because the middle school is pretty much set up to yeah, have middle school. Middle school, yeah, the middle school is like set up for that. So I just know that's that's great feedback, and then that just caused me to think that that also allows that core group to support each other at home too, and call each other questions and pieces like that. So, and just one, and sorry, sorry. Go ahead, <laughs> um, when you mentioned that you're going to try to get uh, special ed children in every day, mm -hmm. does that mean? Anyone who has an IEP? Most likely. Um, the state does ask us to prioritize our highest needs learners. So I will certainly be working with Mr. Petrilli. I don't know if you want to address that. Just really quickly, uh, it came out uh, in this morning's meeting, and I suggested there are guidance counselors tomorrow meet with me. Great. Maybe we could prioritize <coughs> A list, a B list, a C list, at least for a junior senior high school, where the majority of our kids are. Uh, Julie noted that she has 27 children and she plans on feeding them to school. There may even be a situation where we have a student who maybe does not have an IEP but presents with significant learning needs that we want to support and recommend for daily attendance. So I have encouraged both of our principals to be flexible in looking at that along with Mr. Petrilli, but I don't know exactly what that will look like yet. So, um, please know that I know this was not an exhaustive list of questions or considerations. This is an ongoing process. We're continuing uh, to be open to any suggestions and thoughts that anybody might have. Um, thank you to everybody who tuned in tonight to get an idea of where we currently stand, and we will continue to provide updates. Thank you. All right. We also need to then thank you, everyone, for everything. <laughs> I know that there, it doesn't even come close to. I don't know how you're doing it, and I appreciate it. And just keep up the good work. Um, we also need to schedule a day for board retreat that will include everyone on the board and Mrs. Zimmerman and several of you, possibly. So. Uh, Motion, please, to discuss. 
school. Thank you, Tammy. And second? Second. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, so what dates, what month are we looking for? Is it August. August. We are <coughs> And of course, they forgot my folders. This is why I'm forgetting my phone. It's such a terrible thing. <laughs> No, it's in my house. <laughs> Do you have access online? Well, that's okay. No, it's not. My life is not that complicated right now. Is this like a one day? What is this? Time it's a one course? day, generally from 8 to 4, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Usually a Friday. Usually right? a Friday, yes. And what's the second week of August, Friday? 14. 14. That day would work beautifully for me. Works for me. Anybody not being able to do that? I would not be able to do the book. Could I add an item for consideration? Yes. That one of the pieces that we'll be working on that day is establishing our district goals uh, as a board. And then from that, I will be developing my superintendent goals. And then from those, our administrators will be establishing their goals. So the, the I would prefer that we don't wait till the end of August to do that uh, because of all the pieces that would be aligned from there. And I am not available on the 21st. Uh, I'm available the first Friday. What's the first Friday? So, so the seventh. The I'm seven. available the seventh also. Well, that's a week from Friday. I yes. was just going to say that. Yes. That's the thing. If you want to get it done earlier than later, are you available? Um, I I'm also thinking if we want to bring somebody in to talk to us about um, roles of superintendent, roles of board, that type of thing, I might need some time to arrange for if that's something we want to consider. And a week might be too short notice to do that. What's the following Monday? Is Monday? Okay. You can't do Mondays? Monday the 17th? You can't do Mondays at all? It's the busiest day of the week. Okay. So we usually try to go Fridays. About the seventh, and she's leaving. Yeah, the seventh seems to be. It's James, you said you could make that work. Yeah, it should be. Lucy, that's it. We'll do our best yeah. to turn it around. All right. I'm just, I'm, yeah. Sorry, but. No, no, that's all right. right. Did, I will. Yeah. You did talk about it. You think it'll be a full day? Yes. And I know it hasn't it passed. It's, it always it's, is. It's just the nature of our amount of questions. and It's more than a full day. Yeah. <laughs> we don't ever get through the full agenda. No. I'm not going to. Sugarcoat it. It's a full day. <laughs> and then we go, where did the time go? And this is an executive session meeting. So it will not be straight to the public. What time is it? Eight usually. Eight to four. Just block out eight to four. It's the best thing to do. Sorry, I'm sorry. Location? Yeah. It'll be this is the best space for us to be in for social distancing purposes. Food will be provided, however. Usually there's a little continental bagels for breakfast and then some sandwiches and whatnot for lunch. Thank you to Mrs. Miller. <laughs> So we're all set for that? Yep. Okay, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Any, any opposed? And the motion is carried. And the motion is carried and the date board retreat will be August 7th. All right. Uh, and that concludes our public session for today. So I'd like a motion to enter an executive session for the purpose of discussing an evaluation of a particular employee and to review the employment history of a particular employee with no action taken. Motion, please. So moved. Thank you, Tammy. And a second? Second. Thank you, Seth. And thank you, everyone, for coming. And we appreciate, again, all of your efforts. And so.
Have a wonderful rest of your evening and a great night.